from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in Northamptonshire this week in the Midlands region of the country, spending a little bit of time with my parents. The cricket season, though, domestic cricket season here, is just around the corner. County media days are getting underway as we're heading into April and that, of course, means there's snow on the ground. Of course there is. Now, there's no snow in uh, Sydney. Jim Maxwell here. Plenty of rain, record rain. So just as well we're not playing international cricket in Sydney at the moment. But um, the game has uh, been put just over there for the moment because of the Shane Warne Memorial last night at the MCG, which was the most extraordinary event. Uh, the Australian royalty is, has been, people who play sport, or even racehorses for that matter. Um, so it was a, an unbelievable a celebration of the extraordinary life of Shane Keith Warren, whose name now adorns the Great Southern Stand. But uh, it was a show and a half. We'll talk more as we go, but uh, it was quite a remarkable evening. We've heard of snow from Ali. We've heard of rain from Jim. I can tell you about the heat here in Delhi. So I think we've got all bases covered on the weather front. This is Sunil Gupta in Delhi and uh, where we witnessed the trauma of India crashing out of the Women's World Cup because of a no ball on the second last delivery of the game, upon which a catch was taken. And that would have made it three runs of the last ball. But unfortunately, that's the way it goes. And if you talk about fortune changing moments in a game, well, that is one you can chalk down for the record. And of course, the IPL is off with a bang with 200 plus scores being scored uh, and chased down and also low scoring thrillers. We saw one between the KKR and uh, RCB the other day. So it's all happening. As uh, Tony Gregg says, it's all happening in India. Well, we're going to start this week with the state memorial service held for Aussie cricketing legend Shane Warne. I'll tell you what, you know, it was an extraordinary event, Jim, as you said, and not many people get Elton John, Chris Martin and Ed Sheeran all performing at their funeral. But that just shows how big a star Warney was. Just to remind everybody, he died early this month at the age of just 52 from a suspected heart attack. And the state memorial service was held in front of over 50,000 fans at the MCG, the iconic ground that's so close to his heart in his home state of Victoria. And, well, stars from the world of cricket paid their tribute alongside personal friends, long-standing friends, and his three children, Summer, Brooke and Jackson, all shared their memories of, well, a great cricketer, but for them, just simply dad. And I think that was the most poignant part of the service for me, certainly. It was difficult not to shed a tear, and they really did their dad proud as well. They held themselves together in the, the deepest of emotions, really really, and, and said some very personal and poignant things. But Jim, you know, from everybody we heard from, you know, even a representative of the UN to reflect on some of the charity work Warney did, the, the whole event showed just how many people, how many lives Warney managed to touch in his time. He did, yes. It, uh, it was beautifully played by his family, I think, which was very important. Um, his father gave a, well, a, a flawless performance, really. I, I don't think he missed a beat in and that eulogy, uh, and nor did the three children. The uh, most impressive part of the whole show, uh, that they were so in involved and showed, you know, so much humanity in and recognising uh, the contribution that Shane Warne, uh, as a father um, and as a son in, in Keith's case, had, had made. But uh, I don't think, uh, you know, there's... There's, there's any, any doubt when you, you think about Shane Warne uh, and you look at the coverage of that um, a service last night. It was on every major network as well as being on subscription TV. Um, I think the numbers will attest to the fact that uh, he did have a massive following, even for people who didn't necessarily enjoy the game of cricket. Um, we're talking about someone who, who was theatrical in every aspect of the way he played the game. And that's why he was a much larger figure than a, a chap who bowled leg breaks like no one else had ever done in the game of cricket. Um, so it was an, an extraordinary 
evening of um, celebration to, to farewell Warney. Yeah, it really was. And Sonal, we heard from Indian cricket legends as well who paid tribute to him. And there was a, a moment which showed just how much Warney loved the IPL in India. But you know, it's true to say that the people of India loved him back just as much. Oh, yes. I, I mean, the stories are legendary. Um, the episodes are legendary. I mean, there's so many anecdotes about uh, Warney here in India. I'll just go back if you give me a minute or two. The first time he came to India, he didn't know what to expect. And I remember reading a report that he came here and he brought his own baked beans and spaghetti. And he used to eat baked <laughs> beans and spaghetti on toast throughout that tour. <laughs> and then he got to love India. And of course, I think his big time was when he led uh, Rajasthan Royals to their uh, only title, and it was the inaugural title of the IPL. And he is the man responsible for discovering the guy he called the rocket star, the rock star, and that is Ravindra Jadeja, who now, of course, has made it so big and acknowledges it. And he was one of the first to acknowledge uh, Warney's death and, and, and give a very moving tribute to him. And, you know, he used to go to people's houses and have dinner. He used to go casually in shorts, in, you know, in, in, in slippers, as if he was going next door, you know, in Melbourne to have, you know, something on the barbie and a beer. And that's how he was. Uh, it, it, he, he just completely... I think got into people's hearts because he was so real. Yes, there was an element of the theatrical about him, you know, when he was um, on the field. Uh, but when he met people, when you heard him on his commentary, uh, there was no artifice. You know, you, he, you know, you saw what you saw and you got what you saw. And that was it. I think that's why people loved him. And um, you tell me how many, how many uh, players or people have teams of every nationality. I remember the day he passed away, the day after the Pakistan team, the Australian team, the umpires, the Indian team, the Sri Lankan team, the umpires, they were all playing international cricket. They had black armbands on. Now, if that doesn't say anything, then nothing ever will to and testify to what Warney stood for, not just in India, but in the cricketing world. Yeah, he was a boy from Black Rock, but he was absolutely a man of the world and the way cricket had taken him around and the, the impact that he made on everybody who he met, whether they were in cricket or, or outside cricket, whether it was a fleeting uh, moment. You know, there were so many little anecdotes. And just on, on his eating anecdotes, I, I did enjoy uh, from uh, his daughter, one of the daughters who talked about, you know, if they were going out for a, a family meal or if they're on holiday and they'd go out and eat somewhere and he knew in advance it was going to have food that, you know, he didn't like and he wouldn't eat, you know, he wouldn't make a fuss or you know, say, oh, we know, let's not go there because I'm not going to be able to eat anything. He would just order room service in advance. So he had his fill and then just get to the restaurant and say, oh, that's all right, I'm not hungry. Now you guys eat. You know, so little things like that. They were the, the very personal little anecdotes that, that came through on the night. And of course, the evening finished with the unveiling, as Jim mentioned, of the Shane Warne stand. And that the honour of that moment was quite rightly and very appropriately given to his three children. And yeah, they really did their dad proud, thought with their words and, and the way they held themselves through emotion of that evening. It still feels surreal that he's gone, but Shane Warne will live on in the hearts and minds of everyone who came into contact with him. And I feel there's some element of comfort in knowing that he will forever be watching on from the lofty heights of the MCG and able to always watch his beloved sport. Now let's talk Women's World Cup because after 30 matches, 433 wickets and 56 as we now know it's going to be Australia versus the defending champions England in the final. I think it's fair to say that the Aussies have been the dominant ones throughout the competition. They've won all eight of their matches. Who's really stood out for you, Jim? Is it the, the, the likes of Jonathan? We saw Alyssa Healy has got into the century stakes as well leading into the final. I mean, when it comes to the bowling, they're all contributing. I, I always... I enjoyed ever since she came into the side, the uh, the, the leg spinner, um, Alana King. Um, I think she's made a great contribution. But the the surprise player always with bat or ball is Ash Gardner. Uh, and in the field, for that matter, too. I mean, that innings, that uh, cameo she played against uh, New Zealand to cap off a, an extraordinary run, glut at the Basin Reserve, was a, a remarkable demonstration of power and hand-eye coordination. And then she takes the ball and um, she bowls a straight ball better than Nathan Lyon, I reckon. Uh, you, <laughs> you look at the number of times Ash Gardner gets someone out with a ball, it goes dead straight. Uh, that, that kind of top spin stuff she's got. Remarkable cricketer. So 
Australia's just blessed. I mean, as I say, if a couple of players dropped out, and at least Perry has dropped out, uh, there's more than sufficient quality to cover. And, of course, the player can really give it a, a, a nudge and bowl at standing Lee as the all-round Italia McGrath. Um, what a player. So Australia it just seems to have everything covered, batting, bowling and fielding. Um, and um, it may be. Uh, England can put on a show on on the fi- in the final uh, to, to, to make it a, a, a close contest. That's that's what we want. Sophie Eccleston has been really impressive for England as the tall left arm spinner, and she's got twenty wickets, Jim, in the tournament so far. Six for thirty six in the semi final against South Africa. Do you think she could cause some problems for the Australian batters? There's there's trouble around the corner for Australia. Um, if they get off to a dodgy start. Um, and I suppose after putting on 200, they're due for a small, a smaller contribution from the openers, if you like those sort of n- numbers that go around and everything else. But if they get through the first three, uh, defending a score, yes, that's when it could become a very interesting uh, contest. But uh, I think for, for Engl- England to win, they do need to put a score on the board and hope that uh, they're catching, they're at cricket, the rest of it comes together to put pressure on Australia's batting. And um, that could happen. I agree with you. Eccleston's an excellent bowler, very, very fine cricketer, and England have got a number of them. But uh, how they package all that in the atmosphere of a final uh, is the question. Sunil, we've got to talk about India, though, because there were such high hopes, weren't there, for this India team to break through and, and win a World Cup and, you know, how that could transform women's cricket. But, you know, I've read a lot about India's exit from the tournament and there's quite a, a bit of fallout. Some newspapers in India are saying that there's been fitness issues and, and infighting. Um, what have you made of the fallout since India's exit? Well, you know, as they say, um, failure has no uh, parents and, and success has everybody. You know, failure is an orphan. Um, and I think, you know, let's, I don't know about the politics. There is, everybody talks about the politics. There's been a chopping and changing of coaches, as you obviously would know. But I think let's come back to the team. The team that played, the team was an experienced team. Let's talk about Deepti, who bowled that last over. Right? She's an experienced player. She's been around for Yog. She used to, in fact, come up the order in, in batting and is a very, very good off spinner. Now, when you've got three runs to defend of two deliveries, what is the first thing you think of? I should not bowl a no ball. And that's one thing that you must have in the top of your mind. The captain also, and whatever it might be, you've got to take double care of that. And, you know, that was the problem, that you were careless. I think India were careless throughout the tournament. But, you know, what we're missing, and this is something I don't know whether you picked up or whether, you know, a lot of people here have have glossed over it. Actually, this rot, the, the loss started when India were batting. And I'll give you a stat. India were 234 for three in the 43rd over. Three, right? Mithali Raj was there and um, Harman Preet Kaur were there. They're two of the biggest players, biggest hitters. Harman Preet Kaur was the one who knocked Australia out of the semifinals in the 2017 World Cup, that fantastic century. 234 for three ended up at 277. And they scored only 51 runs in the last 10 overs. Now, nobody's talking about that. You're talking about the no-ball, right, which, of course, was important, but nobody's talking about where it all started. Today, England were in a very similar, not today, I mean, in the the semi-final, England were in a very similar position. Uh, They were about 240 in the 43rd over. Where did they end up? 290-odd plus, right? That's the difference. And there's the individual responsibility, isn't there, of those who are in the moment with ball in hand, with bat in hand, in the thick of it, in the climax of the game. But there's also the leadership and the senior players. And I do just want to ask you something about the careers of Mitali Raj and, and Jilang Goswami. Of course, I mentioned she missed the last game with injury. But, I mean, Mitali Raj was asked about her future after the semi-final defeat. And she did say, everything should come to an end. It'll take time to settle the emotions, but that is sport. And she then thanked everyone who turned out to support them and urged them to keep supporting the women's team into the future. Um, it, it, it feels as if this would be the end of the road for her. She has sort of all but, but said so, it feels. But how will India go about replacing those two if they both choose to retire? And who would pick up the captaincy? Is it as simple as, well, you know, Harman Preet is vice and therefore she steps up? 
Yeah, and she's captain in India before mm. in the shorter version of the game as well. Yes. So it's not that she's a stranger to that. She plays uh, <clears throat> in the big bash, uh, uh, the women's big bash as well. She's doing well. So she's an international player. And um, I think, yes, everybody's time does come. Um, and if Mithali decides that she has to go, then at least she's going on some sort of high rather than people turning around and saying, you know, why is she not retiring and so on and so forth. And Julian Goswami, I mean, you know, 39. You know, how long can you keep dragging yourself along? Boli, quick. He's in you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely sensational. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to hand it to them. But then you've got decent bench strength. I think that's the whole point. You've got to be able to get the bench up. That's where really, as, as uh, Jim said about Australia, I mean, if you don't have Elise Perry, you've got other people stepping in. You must have that. But I come back and I want to really make this point about the mental makeup of the team. If there's anything the coaches should concentrate on, it's that. And the 2017 final, again, that's something that I wanted to speak about. I don't know whether you remember, Ali, the final uh, that India played at, uh, at Lords against England. Yeah, I was commenting. England, yeah. Yeah. It, well, there you are. England scored 228. And India were 191 for three in the 43rd over. Yeah. Now you think about they that, right? Seven had it in hand, they had it in their foot, they had it all over the place, <laughs> right? And then to lose by nine runs. I mean, what are we talking yeah. about? You cannot do that. So it was, a, it was an absolute slide. It, 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 I mean, you know, words fail me. We were all speechless when we were watching that. I mean, you know, 191 for three, you know, the drums were beating and everything was happening. And suddenly you see this whole thing going, that to my mind, you know, fielding, all that can be improved. Everything can be done. How do you get your mind strong? That in any sport, as Jim will know, and he's seen much more sport than I have, you have as well. Ali. That is the thing, saying, yes, we can win, even from this position, rather than, oh, you know, are we going to win? Can we do it? Can we get over? The moment mm. doubts creep in, that's it, your history. Well, that was all we've got time for on this week's Stumps here on All India Radio. Don't forget, you can follow us throughout the week on Twitter. We're at BBCWS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumps. You can check us out on YouTube as well. Go to the BBC World Services YouTube channel. My thanks to Sinal Gupta and Jim Maxwell. Thank you all for listening and watching. See you soon. Bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.